Excellent. Uh, welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. This will be the last demo meeting for 2019, and we're sneaking it in on New Year's Eve just under the wire here. So, still counts. All right, let's hop on in. We've got some new modules. Always love talking about the new modules. Our own Shelby Pace added a new module targeting vulnerable versions of OpenMRS, which is an open source customizable medical record system. The web services.rest module prior to version 2.24.0 contains an object deserialization vulnerability, which allows for unauthenticated remote code execution via a malicious XML payload. And I believe we'll have a demo of this. Yeah? Yes. I'm getting a nod and a yes. Awesome. Also, our own Brendan Waters created a new module for privilege escalation on Windows 10 targets. This module leverages two vulnerabilities on specific builds of Windows 10 to move from an authenticated user of any level to NT Authority local service via the universal plug and play device host service, and then move from the NT Authority local service level to NT Authority system via the update orchestrator service. That's super cool. And I believe we'll have a demo of this as well. Community contributor Fra created a new module for injecting shellcode into a Windows target process, providing execution from memory. This module allows you to specify the ID of the process to inject into, or the module could spawn a new notepad process for injection. And tools like Donut can help get your shellcode set up for in-memory execution. Easy peasy. You can see, you actually see a demo of this from our previous demo meeting recording on YouTube there. Community contributor Blue Sentinel Sec added a new module for achieving persistence on a target via bash profile. Uh, this module will upload a payload to the target and then update the bash profile or bash RC file to execute the payload each time a new shell session is instantiated. Persistence pays off. And community contributor B. Cole swung by with a new module for doing privesk against a Linux target, which has the reptile rootkit installed. Using an existing session, this new module will upload a payload and execute via the reptile command utility on the target, which permits elevating privileges to root. On success, you'll have a new session as the root user. Good stuff there. And outside of modules, we have a lot of, a lot of other valuable work going on to talk about. Our community contributor Xmunos updated much of the Python code and framework to be compatible with Python 3, which is really awesome to have, considering that support for Python 2.7 officially ends tonight at midnight, if I'm not mistaken. So. Big, big thank you to Xmunos for that. Community contributor B. Coles updated the Linux RDS Privesk module to use newer Metasploit libraries and also renamed it so that future RDS exploits can be added without name collisions. Our own Will Vu refactored the check scanner mixin to be check module, allowing exploit modules to uh, check methods to invoke auxiliary modules, not just scanning modules. Will Vu also added the force exploit option to the Morris finger D buffer overflow and Morris send mail debug exploit modules, enforcing an automatic check before exploitation unless force exploit is set. And community contributor Matteo Cantoni updated the host header injection auxiliary HTTP, HTTP scanning module by adding new options to set the HTTP request method and post data, while also adding the xhost HTTP header to the request and defaulting the target host to a random host URL. Good stuff. And some more enhancements and features to talk about. Our own Jeffrey Martin added support for MDM module ref objects when linking references to volumes. And Jeffrey also removed places in the framework DB layer where calls alter the argument array values contained in the ops object in unexpected ways. I gotta say, I, I really liked that view. <coughs> just just the, all the places where it's like, oh good, side effects are all gone. Yeah, it's yeah. really good. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like cleaning up, that's a good thing. Our own Adam Galway added a new has check method for modules to understand if a module has the ability to check the target vulnerability. Uh, I had the opportunity to tweak the John the Ripper version checking a little bit to more clearly error out when a non-jumbo John the Ripper version is present. Uh, thanks to Hoodie and B calls for the assists there. And community contributor Ken LaCroix came through with even more module docs for five Windows post gather modules. So Ken, appreciate that. Star. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Those, those, uh, those module docs really help uh, new and old users alike. It's nice having those. And some bug fixes. Uh, see, community contributor B. Cole spent some quality time in the NetFilter Privesk IPv4 local exploit module fixing a number of bugs and correcting some inaccuracies. Appreciate that. Our own Shelby Pace fixed a missing require statement in encrypted shell for Windows targets. 
our own Jeffrey Martin fix their create credential and login method to return the correct login object. Uh, for details on recent free market activity, you can always check out the weekly Metasploit wrap up blog post at blog.rapid7.com. We even have some Hacksmas posts uh, up there for, for this, this month. Uh, three, I guess, at the moment. Uh, one, huh? Usually, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm looking at somebody who's been on vacation. Uh, he's recently back. Welcome back, Caitlin. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you have one uh, just as of the beginning of this week, so Metasploit yeah, moments of the year. Yeah, we actually have a, a Metasploit annual wrap up. So if you missed anything <laughs> happened this year, how dare you, first of all? And second, you can go look at a bunch of the highlights from the last 12 months. Yeah, it's a nice uh, TLDR. Even if you did see the stuff as it, as it kind of came by in wrap ups, there's it's a nice collection of, of a, a overview of the year. Uh, Brent had a wrap up, a Hacksmith post as well, as well did Adam Kamek. Yes, well. yeah. yes. I revisited all my old Hacksmith posts and saw if I was actually telling the truth or lying. And um, <laughs> it was about 70% true. All so right, that's all good. Right, the Ghosts know. of Christmas, Hacksmith's past weren't uh, all wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, Adam's got a really cool article on um, Linux memory smuggling. Laundering. What? La laundering. Laundering. I'm laundering. sorry. Smuggling, smuggling laundering. I like that. I like that. Something. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so there's some, some good posts up on blog.rapid7.com, which is the same place we post the weekly Metasploit wrap up. So go check it out there. Um, and as always, a huge thanks to everyone who helps make Metasploit better through contributions and time, including our contributors, people who help review PRs, and people who help commit PRs. So we appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank Aww. you. For, thank you for all that. My daughter really likes this, this dog gift. So That's a good gift. I think it's I a like good one. Gift. It looks happy. That's and good and on, on that good doggo note, let's move on to the things everybody likes. Demos. Yay. Yay. I believe Brent might have an open MRS demo for us. Let me right. unshare. All right. You have the power. Uh, so open MRS. You might wonder, well, what the heck is open MRS? Um, I was wondering. Well, you can use the info-d command in Metasploit, and um, actually it won't pop up because uh, this is not a local machine. Um, but you can type the info command and you can get some information about it. So OpenMRS stands for Open Medical Record System. Um, this is an open source uh, medical records tool that you can use within your medical practice or hospital or what have you. Um, it's got over 3,000 installations uh, um, around the world, mostly focused in Africa. And um, it is basically used to store patient records and um, that kind of thing. Um, so it's very important that this kind of software stays secure and off the internet. Um, what it had was a pretty, pretty textbook Java deserialization vulnerability. Basically, there was an unauthenticated path that allowed, um, uh, basically as part of their API, that allowed um, incoming uh, what's called an extreme XML object to be consumed. And inside the object, um, depending on which Java version you have installed, um, you can instantiate objects that have nice gadgets that allow you to do arbitrary command execution. Um, to, to kind of, if you've ever been a little bit mystified, I know I was a little bit mystified, just thinking about Java remote code execution through object deserialization. Um, sometimes it sounds very weird and mysterious. You're like, what does that mean, object deserialization? Well, one of the great things about this exploit module um, is it actually makes it really easy to visualize. Um, you can see here it uses a file called payload.erb. Um, unlike maybe some other Java deserialization bugs, this is actually just plain XML. And I know plain XML is it, still code, but it's, uh, I'll show you here in a second and, uh, and you'll, you'll, you'll hopefully agree that this is uh, very easy to see how it could be exploited. So I'll go ahead and, and uh, type edit this file. Oops. Sorry, I copied the wrong thing. There we go. Um, so this is the actual file that represents the object that gets instantiated within the tool itself. And you can see here that first it instantiates a string and it's actually labeled as a JDK Nashorn internal objects native string. Um, there's actually an external tool you can use to generate these little XML files for you. Um, but they basically examine what, what target Java development kit you have what available objects that can be instantiated, and whether there's something that, that supplies what's called a gadget. In this case, um, the Java X image IO spy filter iterator happens to um, instantiate a filter iterator, and instead of filter iterator, there's a process builder, <laughs> which lets you supply command. Um, so just through basically featureitis, you might say, um, there happened to be a way to create an object that created an object that created an object that happened to have a method that let you run a command. 
<laughs> so it's kind of clever stuff, but when you can kind of see it um, sort of laid out like this, it makes a lot more clear what's going on. Um, so what this basically does is it just has to post this XML. Now the payload itself um, takes advantage of Metasploit's ability to, to slice and dice payloads in various ways. In this particular case um, for our options, show options, we're going to instantiate Meterpreter. Um, so you might wonder, well, if I'm just running a command, how do I instantiate Meterpreter? Well, this uses something called the printf command stager. So what it basically does is under the covers, it basically just prints a bunch of strings using the Unix printf command from a shell, writes them to a file, and then executes it. So uh, that's basically how it manages to do a, create a command execution into a file upload. It's just by continuing to just print over and over and over again. And that's one of the built-in features of Metasploit, in case you ever wondered, like, how does the magic work? That's what Metasploit does, is it turns binaries into printf statements that get injected in XML and posted to web pages. So, with that, with that much ado, here's our shell. <laughs> Super reliable. Um, it's actually a feature it, um, later on. Uh, now, what's kind of interesting also about this is that um, whether or not this uh, exploit is successful or not depends almost wholly on which JDK you're running. So, for instance, if you run JDK 11, this exploit fails because the constructor for the objects that we instantiate with the XML take different method parameters. You'd have to change the XML around to, to make it work on JDK 11. This is JDK 8, which was the only one that worked um, with the particular module. Uh, JDK 7, again, you have specifics about that that require you to target it. What's kind of cool is if you, um, in the side of Metasploit, um, if you've never really followed them before, the references are actually super handy because they actually have all the notes from the original um, exploit authors that talk about how you would actually exploit this and what are the caveats involved. And I just, again, didn't copy and paste correctly. Let's try again. Computers are hard. I know, right? <clears throat> I know I Google search for a link. <laughs> but here you can see that um, it kind of goes into all kinds of detail about uh, how you exploit it, what are the, the preconditions, all that sort of thing. Um, uh, so, so yeah, um, wealth of information, wealth of metadata, really easy to use exploit. If you use open MRS, first oh, of all, don't put it on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Second of all, patch it. Um, this this uh, bug has been in the product for a long, long time. Um, so um, you can also speak it's also been patched for about a year. You so can patch it first and then not put it on the internet too if you want. Yeah, you can do why it not both? Any, you can yeah. do it in any order. Yeah. Sounds perfect. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did that out of order, but yeah, yeah, you get the picture. Yeah. All right. Cool. So yeah, just to your point, they did that. The security advisor did come out of like February of this last year with instructions on how to how to patch That's and right. things. The, the remediations to take. So yeah. Um, but yeah, make if you're running open MRS, make sure you're running a current version. <laughs> Absolutely. Or, and not vulnerable, not vulnerable to this thing anyway. Awesome. Thank you, Brent. Mm -hmm. And. Take a look at Windows comma hawk privilege escalation. Brendan. Hello. Hello. Cool. As you can see here, there's a, I've, I'm basically just using multi-handler to get a, a user level access on a Windows machine. Uh, in this case, it's a Windows release, Windows 10 X64 release uh, 1803, which is build 17134. Notice there's nothing up my sleeve. Uh, I can't get system through normal means. In this case, we'll go ahead and use the Comahawk uh, exploit module. Really, the only thing you need to tell it is a uh, session. Here, I will point out there's an exploit timeout setting. This is a very long running exploit. So give it time, and if it times out, you may need to increase that exploit timeout. Uh, one of the things that it does is it actually uses the service control manager to create the service. And for anybody that's played with the service control manager on Windows machines, you know that that is not something that is a snappy interface. Uh, so it does take time. So here we go. We've gone ahead and launched it. Uh, again, warning here, it may take a, a, a moment after the session is established because, all right, we've got our session back, but We've created a service, we've started a service, and now we have to clean up the service. And so that's what's gonna take a little bit longer. And the way that this works is it uses that UPnP service to, uh, just like Pierce said, create uh, a user as a local service. 
And then there's that second update orchestrator bug that allows us to go from uh, local service to system. I will warn that this is not a particularly stealthy uh, exploit as the service control manager commands are embedded in the exe that gets uploaded. Uh, and also the there's a specific uh, UUID that's contained within it. So fingerprinting this would not be hard. So bear that in mind when you use it. And here we go. We have our session back NT authority system. Nice. Does anybody have any questions? Does anyone have a fingerprint for it already? Uh, I, I have not, I have not seen anybody say they have a fingerprint for it. This is only, I think, two months old. Okay. Uh, but for those blue teamers out there, you know, not hard. Run, run, uh, run strings on the exe and flag this thing. <laughs> oh well. Also, if you update your Windows 10 machines. That'd be good too. Cool. Any uh, any questions for Brendan? Going once. Awesome. What's your favorite build of Windows 10? <laughs> uh, for for what? Right <laughs> now, I use 1803 because it's a pretty nice version for uh, testing because it's still moderately up to date, uh, but okay. not bleeding edge. Mm. Okay. Cool. There you have it. Awesome. Thanks, Brendan. And on that, on that note, uh, I think that's it for we've got for the meeting today. Um, give everybody 40 minutes back is a, is a nice way to kind of head into New Year's Eve here. So happy, happy 2020. Have a safe and happy New Year's. And um, see you all, I guess, next year. Dad joke. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Take care. Happy right. New Year. Thanks. Happy New Bye -bye. Year. Excellent.